Greetings and welcome to an Educational Otherwise, an occasional conversation series where we dream together in public about teaching and learning for collective futures. I'm Django Paris, and I'm really grateful to be joining you from these beautiful Coast Salish lands. I'm here at the Bank Center for Educational Justice in the College of Education at the University of Washington. And um, just really overjoyed and feeling very grateful to be joined by two wonderful people today, um, Chelsea Craig and Anthony Craig, um, two folks who are uh, educational leaders, um, long-term educators, um, contribute so much to their communities. Also two people that I've been really thankful to be learning with over the last uh, four years now, I think it is, amazingly, and um, really, looking forward to the opportunity to, to um, have a conversation where some of some of my learning and many people um, who, who Chelsea and Anthony have sort of impacted over the years um, have a chance for others to, to hear about this beautiful work. I should also say that um, Chelsea and Anthony um, are really family um, to me and Ray Paris and our family. And, um, you know, in in sort of black traditions of chosen kinship or certainly chosen kin, um, thinking about learning from you both, you know, from native and indigenous perspectives and, and, and particularly from perspectives and, and understandings of these territories about the, the understanding of becoming relatives, something that I think, you know, we'll definitely talk about in ways today, um, but it's just been such a gift to, um, to become your relatives. And so thank you for spending some time to to talk and think in a way that we often do together anyway, but now we get to do it a little bit more um, publicly. So uh, more officially joining us are Chelsea Craig um, from Tulalip Tribes, which is about 45 minutes north of where I sit here in Seattle. Chelsea is a long-term education and cultural leader alongside children and her community. She's currently vice principal at Quilcita Tulalip Elementary School. And before long um, will be Dr. Chelsea Craig. Uh, so also joining us um, is uh, Dr. Anthony Craig, um, citizen of the Yakima Nation, uh, which is on the east of here on the other side of the mountains from where I sit here in Seattle. Anthony is also a long-term educator and leader uh, on these territories and alongside Chelsea um, up at Tulalip. Anthony is also a colleague here in the College of Education, uh, professor of practice, the director of the Leadership for Learning doctoral program, and also an affiliate faculty with us in the Bank Center. So I get to learn and work with Chelsea and Anthony quite a lot. So thank you so much for, for joining us as we navigate these dire times and push for a beautiful otherwise. And so I think, you know, when I'm having these conversations and when I'm doing work and just when I'm living across these times, I kind of remind myself um, of how difficult they are, but also the beautiful work that's going on. And so I thought we might just start uh, if we could hear a little bit more about um, why each of you chose education as a life path. Um, why education? And maybe we could start with you, Chelsea, any stories or people or teachings that come to mind when, when you think why education um, has become sort of your life path and your life's work? Sure. Um, well, to me, education is about healing um, and interrupting systems that have always been harmful for my people. So personally, it was because a high school counselor said, oh, no, you can't go to college. You don't have what it takes. Mm. Uh, you don't have the money. You don't have the grades. So I left his office and said, not only am I going to college, but I'm going to come back and take your job. That really launched <laughs> to be honest with you. I hadn't even thought that that could be a pathway for me until That's he right set the example of what not to do. <laughs> mm. um, but then as I started exploring that, it really is about um, healing and bringing back some teachings that needed to happen. Um, my grandmother is a survivor of the Tulalip boarding school and, um, and really every, every generation since then have been actively harmed in the name of education. So That's I, right. I really am committed to interrupting that and bringing about healing and change. Mm, thank you for that, Chelsea. Um, Anthony? 
Yeah, I, I'm writing down a couple of things. Chelsea just said, I, I think that uh, my story continues to develop. How I think I got here is mostly because of my elders. So my uh, dad was a teacher my whole life. He was a non-Native person, but born and raised on uh, the Yakama Nation, taught in our community for 35 years. That's so right. I grew up in schools. It was just a normal place to be in my dad's classroom in uh talking to teachers like they were real humans because my dad was very, very real and authentic, mm. but also my grandmother. My grandmother um, also survived boarding school. Uh, she was at St. George's Indian School in Tacoma, was taken from uh, her home at Atanum on the reservation and went to St. George's Indian School and then uh, grew up to want to be an educator, want to be a teacher. And she said, well, Indians mm. didn't get to go to college then you know, was sort of a paraphrase of how she shared that with me. Nothing negative about it, just a uh, matter right. of fact. But she was also a leader. She was the head secretary for the school district, uh, Mount Adams School District in White Swan, uh, where my family comes from, and led led that school, led that school district, and made sure there was uh, clarity about the importance of education, about what what our community could and should do in schools. So my dad and my grandma, and Similar to what Chelsea's saying, I, I didn't have um, as like blunt and um, in my mm -hmm. face negativity, but walking into kindergarten and thinking to myself, it doesn't have to be like this. And I, it's really vivid to me. And it, it seems uh, like, like it couldn't be true, but seriously walked into kindergarten and thought I, I could make this different and mm -hmm. wanted to be a kindergarten teacher from that kindergarten year. And that's what I grew up to do. I happened to do it in Talela. So I That's met right. Chelsea. So Chelsea's part of my story. It, it's much easier to do this work in a collective. So it happens to be a husband-wife collective, but other Native educators. And who who wants to imagine something different? So Chelsea's a reason that I'm standing here. And then I think our children and and um, maybe most importantly, right in this moment, our grandson. He's sitting That's in right. kindergarten. So we're in, we're in this full circle moment of uh, I can remember walking into kindergarten and now I'm sending my grandson there. And on one hand, there are many, many things that are better and good and right. That's right. And on the other hand, there are some things that were happening in 1981 that are still happening in 2023, 24. So still, still developing Django, like what, what am I doing here? And what's my opportunity and responsibility and I hold my grandma and my grandson at the very same time and am answerable to both of them. This idea, um, thank you both so much for this. I mean, the idea of sort of answerability and responsibility and who we're responsible to is just really shining through and what you're sharing. Um, it is something that I really, has really resonated with, um, you know, in my learning from both of you sort of about intergenerationality. Um, in so many ways, but including um, in, a, in a given time. So the fact that you're talking about your grandson, um, your both grandson um, and, your, and your ancestors, you're talking about your children, you're talking about your parents, um, all within, um, you know, a, 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 a learning, e in a sense, a learning ecosystem um, is, is I think really powerful. I'm also remembering when you, as you shared your uh, story there, Chelsea, um, my high school counselor who told me straight up, you're not Berkeley material. Um, and he had gone to Berkeley. And maybe by some uh, measures I wasn't, but anyway, some things happened. I went there um, and, and this, is, this, is how, this is how these stories unfold. Um, I recently told my undergrad culturally sustaining pedagogy class um, that I didn't do all that well in, um, it, you know, in high school necessarily, um, and that uh, that I didn't do all that well on some of these um, standardized tests, and it, and it took some of them aback because they said, "Oh, you've become a professor. It must have been." So we've had some sort of conversations about about these things that you know um, some people schooling can can be you know maybe it was a great time, others not so much, others in between, but that doesn't mean that education might not become one's life path uh, in some way. So thank you so much for, for, for both of those sharings. Um, it's also something to hear you talk about, um, you know, and, and just start um, in some ways thinking about um, 
the most horrific of schooling experiences um, on your own territories and your own lands. And, and yet, um, you know, what, you know, where, where you all are in your work and, and how that um, in a sense is, is part of, of the schools that in the, in the education settings that you want to, to be a part of. Um, so thinking about your grandson and thinking about your children, thinking about you too, um, and, and then thinking about Kulsita Tulalip Elementary School and before, um, I think, which was called Tulalip um, Elementary School or, or Old Tulalip. Um, so you've been at this with children in your communities for, I think, nearly two decades, um, which is really um, amazing to think about. Um, can you share a bit about the early days? And I know that Chelsea, your grandfather, uh, an important you know, leader um, for your people and across Coast Salish territories, Bernie Gobin had shared with both of you early in his teaching, uh, uh, that's teaching, right? Um, he had said, you already know enough to get started. And I remember when you first shared that with me, it, it was just one of those most incredible teachings and revelations and then trying to understand what he meant and how you have carried that forward. So he said to you as young educators, you already know enough to get started as young native educators, right? Uh, maybe you could begin there and talk a little bit about what that teaching was um, and how you all took it up in your work. Yeah, I, uh, I just wanna say nearly three decades. Ah, three decades, yeah, all, yeah. don't come as short. We, 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 start, yeah, we started in the 90s. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanna be clear, we started in the 90s. As did I, I think this is my, yeah, I think I'm at 27 or 28 um, years as an educator uh, this year. <laughs> he yeah. said, don't cut me short, dude. I yeah. have three decades. <laughs> okay, Chelsea, do you want to pick up where Django? You could get us started if you don't mind. I, I would love to. I, I think uh, I celebrate all those years. I started, yes, I started thinking about these things when I was young and on my reservation, but I couldn't have known that uh, Talela people were out here, um, treaty rights uh, are central to all of the people I've met in Tulalip in a way that education doesn't hmm. always necessarily intersect in that way. But I met this family, this Gobin family that Chelsea's from, and Grandpa Bernie being the central figure there along with Grandma D, That's right. Uh, both leaders in, in Tulalip who I think like my grandmother, my dad, my mom spoke life into us. So we, I think uh, Western schooling can, can try to suck the life out of you. Tell Chelsea, she's not good enough. Tell Django, he's not good enough. Um, make me believe this is how kindergarten had to be for, for instance, right. as a five-year-old. But then there's grandpa Bernie reminding us, well, actually you already have a way. So we first stepped into our jobs I think absorbing and embodying sort of the agitation of of being now agents of these assimilative forces that are schools. So it it, it was reading curriculum, absolutely behavior programs, attendance, how you walk in a line or don't, when you're silent, who you can talk to, reading groups. Uh, just it stacks on top of each other. The the sort of the um, constraints that we put on young people to fit into these you know, boxes and lines in our grade books or our computer grading program. Which are really Other settler things. logics, yes. Yes, so all of those settler logics, I think we first, we were young 20-somethings, and I think at first we thought we had to enact and enforce those, and and we were making ourselves sick. We'd go home and just be feel defeated. Because, right. yeah, I mentioned um, my kids and Chelsea, but my first kindergartners who, who are now 30, 31 years old, were amazing people. And I could not look these beautiful Tulalip people in the eyes, these five That's and six right. year olds, and try to change them from who they were fundamentally. But things like positive behavior, intervention and supports, PBIS, oh, give it an acronym, that is meant to sort of like change who they are fundamentally and how they interact with each other, how they interact with me as an elder, so all that to say, Grandpa Bernie was very frank with us and said, Koyadachev, you already have a way. There are already ways of teaching and learning that make sense here. Go do that, whatever that is. And it wasn't like, oh, you poor kids. It was stop being a victim. You That's understand right. what's right and wrong. 
you're participating in what feels wrong for you, for the young people, for the community, for the ancestors. For now, these lands. participate in what is right. So I'll, I'll leave it there, Chelsea, just to say that, mm. that, was the, that was the initial push for us, like past our own sort of um, agitation or concern, uh, worry about eva performance evaluations, was grandpa saying, none of that matters if you don't let it matter. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I just am thinking about back to that moment when he told us that so many years ago and how strong of a teaching that is, that it's, mm. it sustains us today. Even today, we're in that battle against colonization to right. our own mindset and the uh, everything the air touches in the school because it's all colonized. Um, that is what grounds us and keeps us going forward. Um, and and in reflection, he he was training us our whole lives for this work, for whatever oh, wow. way we go. And um, wow. and so when you talk about we, you already have, it was a lifetime of training to get us to where we are. And the reality is, he's still with us, That's standing right. alongside of us. He's with us now ensuring that we have the strength to keep moving forward because our ancestors fought the fight um, and they never stopped when it was tough. So that it just, there's so much teachings around just that one statement. Yeah. Django, can I add one thing Please. <clears throat> with treaty rights? What Chelsea just said, I, I like to underscore that because what our ancestors and elders fought for was for self-determination was for us to be the decision makers, to have space to refuse. And we were sort of handing back some of our sovereignty, some of right. our self-determination in that moment. That's why it was so, he was so forward with us. So uh, matter of fact, here's the bottom line. We have a choice to make here. And that, you know, Chelsea's family, you know, I, I met I met the Gobins when I was in my early 20s. So, you know, mm -hmm. yes, a lot of my life, but not my whole life. But That's those right. like those fundamental teachings that grandpa would just say, what about the treaty at any point in a conversation and his kids and <laughs> grandkids then can check in? Oh, that's right. We need to be focused on the treaty. We have obligation to our future generations to enact something here. And you have to make those decisions. So the the keep going is that we're still in a settler colon, colonial state, yet we're from very powerful nations. Um, goodness, uh, you too. This is just so um, so important. I'm I'm hearing so many things. I mean, one of the things that you said there, Chelsea, that it sustained you all these years later. This powerful teaching and sort of the dimensions of the teachings and how it's carried out. Um, really is important for us to think about. Um, the idea of we were being trained our whole lives for this also, I think, really gives um, some important insight into what we think about when we think about learning to teach or we think about learning to be a, a, an educational leader or we think about, right, um, that 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 the the learning to teach learning to be a leader is something that happens you know before we're born while we're here and then onward because as you're talking about that sort of what anthony what you've been you know calling the ancestral gaze is is continually leading you um in your work in the present and so you know this is i feel like uh, a teaching that um, to see you two enacting it across 30 years uh, is really a special thing and something that um, anybody who, you know, children, families, and community members who's lucky enough to sort of be in your orbit um, is, is really gifted to, to try to, to grapple with and try to live into, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to even know where to go um, from there. Maybe we'll just end the episode there. That's it. You get one teaching. Um, but I, I am thinking about one teaching that can sustain you, right, uh, forever. I am thinking about um, 
some very sort of specific enactments of this teaching um, that might be useful for, for people to hear about and think about in terms of, okay, if, if, um, if you all already have a way, um, then how does that way become part of, um, you know, what you've shared, Anthony, you know, and described as these, you know, ongoing, um, you know, settler colonial or state, you know, mandated and sanctioned um, schooling settings. How does that teaching then become, you know, where, where, where does it go um, with, with the decisions you're making as teachers, as school leaders, um, where's the space for it? Um, and, and so I think of course of this, this um, practice that you all introduced and have been part of now for maybe, you know, 20 years or however many it is of morning assembly um, where you um, drum and sing the day into being with young children. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about that, either how it started or what it is just as sort of an enactment of um, bringing that way, um, sometimes forcing that way, but clearing space for that way to be um, even inside the walls of schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Charles, I'll, I wanna offer a couple of things and you could describe morning assembly, but Django, your very question is, is our question. What does this look like? What are specific enactments of this? Because that, that door isn't held open for us. We have to, take the door off the hinges or get out of the room that has the door. But it's a daily question. Like what, what should we be doing here? Because the default is just so thick in our it's veins. So thick. The default of the settler state and the settler sanctioned schools. And then, you know, imagining an otherwise, even within our own community uh, can be a challenge because people of don't course. can't bring their imagination there. Like, well, don't we want our kids to read and write? Absolutely. And to right. get them there doesn't mean, you know, the the this particular path, yeah. Yes, the, this curriculum. So we we're just saying we don't have it all figured out. And I think no, that Chelsea and I like to say that up front because people might turn off the episode and think, oh, they they think they know everything. We don't. It, it's our commitment to every day trying to figure it out and to determine what are the ancestors like. The the gaze is real. So I you know we got we got there from uh, Toni Morrison's PBS interview where she That's takes right. her finger and flicks the white man off her shoulder. So to remove to remove the the white gaze means we wanted to know well, who is looking on. Who do we want to imagine and to be with? Well, Grandpa Bernie, the ancestors, my grandma, my dad. If they're looking down, feeling like yes, this is. This is it. There's uh, Tiatmas, uh, an elder who's been gone a few years here. He has a quote where he talks about the old ones looking down and do they have tears in their eyes because of happiness. Tears, happy tears in their eyes looking down at the, the people who are here because they're living the life that's recognizable, that feels good, and that can feel so mystical. Well, we want to be mm -hmm. concrete. We want to talk about mm -hmm. what that means in a day-to-day -day for the young people. So uh, we look for these opportunities. So not not to trick anybody, but to no. say, oh, what's possible there? Spelei, Coyote taught us to always be ready. So as soon as there was a question about what should kids do before school, we kicked into gear and said, oh, hey, you sent us on a tour of other high-performing schools, including Nia Bay. So we went and saw right. this macaw enactment of a morning gathering where the whole school came to the gym, the principal greeted them there, well, we thought, hey, we we like that. We went to Chief Leshai School, you know, that, that's been culturally rich for some time. They had a morning gathering with song. And once someone asked the question, what could we be doing here? Chelsea and I and, you know, our, our teacher relatives were ready. We could do a morning assembly. Here's what it could look like. Wow. Yeah, so Chelsea, Chelsea, do you want to share a little bit about, yeah, how that either started or, or, or how it's continued or both? Sure. So, so the trickster part of it was to, to help manage students before school, because before they were lined up outside the door waiting for the bell to ring and they were unsupervised. So we brought them all in um, and we could support them in that space. Um, and in consideration of the genocide that was, that happened in the name of education, it's the least we can do to mm. start every day with a traditional song. So we thought, well, let's start with, uh, we brought our own family song in, my son and I, he was a kindergartner and we 
went in front of the whole school and shared our family song. And um, within that first week, we had other relatives bring their sons and their songs. And it just happened that quickly that then we became that community there. Wow. And that that was little children generational work. Um, it naturally happened where um, drummers would grow in a natural way. So then when they, when our older generation moved on to middle school, right. the young ones in training were ready to carry that work forward. So that natural learning um, that would happen in a longhouse in a family was in happening in this school to then that is sustainable work. So I That's like right. to think about morning assembly as we reclaimed eight minutes in the morning from, uh, from this setting, we organize our, our gym in a longhouse style, longhouse protocol. Kids are taught how to behave in a longhouse, how to act on that floor. And, and we've outgrown our, our gym floor. There's so many <laughs> and dancers and, um, and that's healing work. That, it, mm -hmm. uh, I'll add two two thoughts, Django. One, yes. Um, well, when we first brought this forward, and probably to this day, non-native people mostly, maybe some native people too. But isn't this instructional time? We're right. we're missing instructional time. So Chelsea's exactly right. We we started by saying, well, we think this could take about seven minutes, ten minutes at the longest. <laughs> wow, you know, so we, right. we did slice it up in that way. Yeah. And um, it, it does matter that then we said, well, this, you know, this technical thing we did to, to move students because of supervision then became an answer to our question about how do we teach behaviors? Well, right. the culture is not just song and dance. Song and dance is, is a critical part that we start with, but the culture includes how do you carry yourself? That's how right. are fifth grade students responsible for kindergarten students? When I would, I used to watch my kindergartners cross this overpass to get over the road. They were walk, you know, the walkers to school. Well, they were always with older siblings or cousins. And I, I'd watch this one grandma say, "Now you take care of your sister." But as soon as right. they got there, the sister was expected to go to her line. So we we're dividing kids up by age. That morning assembly actually let us stay in a multi-age space where then they could do what their grandma said. I can watch my sister until she's safely with her teacher. So it matched what the ways we've been brought up to, to be in a collective, to be in a communal space. So how you carry yourself, who you're responsible to, who can see you, that, that's the culture as well. And it answered that question of how are we reminding kids or teaching them to move in these collective or communal spaces? That and matters. reminding ourselves, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it it, it fit all, all sorts of needs and um, in addition to the song and dance, we brought in uh, their the Tulalip tribal values. Like, what does it mean to uh, care about the people around you? Well, there's a story for that. So it gave space for then a storyteller to come in. So it 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 was is one opening that turned into all these opportunities for a really culturally rich space, even if we were just reclaiming seven to ten minutes. It, it's it's such a powerful example because I think too that what you're saying is the ways that it opened up other opportunities um, and other sort of um, rememberings and curiosities from the community, right? And you've shared how others were saying, oh, you know, that's not something that necessarily I've had a, lo a lot of chance to do. Um, can I be here and be part of this? Um, it, uh, and, um, and then, you know, I'm starting to think about, well, um, you know, what, who 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 can participate in this and how can how can we kind of build it out having been able to witness a few times morning assembly including the the sort of big assembly on Tulalip day but but even the daily one um i have been absolutely struck by the transformation of the space and um as a way to begin um as a way to open a day and um, I know, you know, I, I don't know when when this came about, probably just a few years ago, um, but they, the young young drummers calling themselves the Res Dogs and the dancers calling themselves the Sailor Sisters. It's an absolutely beautiful thing um, that you all um, have been part of 
um, opening space for and curating over time. And Chelsea, you're talking about Kamaikan, Kamaikan Craig, um, your your wonderful son, um, who was five at the time and is now twenty one. 21 and working at Quilcita to Laylip Elementary School alongside you. Can you say just a little bit about that? Because Anthony, you were also talking about those kindergartners who are now 30, right? And as someone who's been teaching for a long time, I, you know, that certainly resonates with me when you know, um, you know, uh, adults in the community who you um, had, were able to share that sort of time with early in their lives. Can you talk a little bit about that, Chelsea, just about maybe maybe talking about Kamaikan and what he's doing now and how that's sort of an example of growing some of what you've talked about into um, the sort of the fabric of the learning setting? Sure. I, I actually was already thinking that after I was talking about Kamaikan, because that's data. When you talk about, is this measure successful in school? Well, I have someone who started in fifth grade, in, in five years old, and now is leading cultural work with students. So that is full circle. But That's also right. full circles, the other two young men who brought their songs, their nephews are leading that now. So that is multi-generational data that shows the power of this work. I often stand back and just watch this work happen because I can do that now because it lives and it's driven That's by right. students. And I'm always touched because I can see their parents. I can see their uncles and aunties. And I can also always feel our ancestors with us. It was my responsibility from um, elders from the Tulalip tribes to watch over that work, to make sure that things were done in a good way, to protect our students. So um, I, it's just... I know that this is sustainable work because it's the right work that should be happening. That's right. And um, when you when you have, when you know that, um, you know, in um, sort of a soulful sense, uh, then um, it really also is fuel for all the battles that we all have to fight. And, and, and for those who want to do things this other way, um, which we know is harmful to us and communities. And so um, I really um, want us all as we listen to this to kind of call, where is that center for us um, and who um, and, and how can it carry us forward in the work that we know we need to do? I've shared this with both of you in some ways, but um, you know, oftentimes you, you, you can ask yourself the question, um, can this happen in nation state schools as they are? We know that in so many ways they're designed in a sense, Anthony, you were talking about um, the, and Chelsea, you know, you're talking about when kids would come with, a, with, with, you know, they'd maybe come, let's just say with grandma, older sister, younger brother or something. And then suddenly the school severs all that. Grandma, you go away. Um, older sister, you go over here. Younger, you're over here. And that in so many ways, these schools, the design of settler colonial nation state schools has been about severing those mm -hmm. relationships. And you all have shown or taught me that it is possible and it's hard, but it is possible to, to sort of reconnect and restitch those um, uh, in very um, beautiful, but also very concrete ways. But it's still a school building, there's bells, there's rooms, right? And, and, and so, one thing I'm thinking about in relation to that, um, Chelsea, is what you've talked about recently in terms of becoming relatives in education. And do you want to talk a little bit about what you mean by that or what you're trying to think about in, in that work? Sure. Well, as a teacher, one of the things that I always thought about is I wanted my classroom to feel like we were in my living room. I'm their auntie and we're, and we're just learning in this space. So I would create my environment like that. So that's really be, being relatives. Literally, my students are my relatives. Well, what does that look like, and how do we support a, our educators and all of the all of our relatives in the in the school setting to be thinking that way? Right. Well, if we don't say it, and we don't believe that it could happen, it won't happen. So that's for sure. It's not perfect, but we are working to become relatives through modeling um, with each other as adults 
through modeling at this morning assembly when I tell them every day that I love them. And you can see it starting to um, enact and spread across our building. Um, mm. And it is a constant battle, honestly. That's it's right. a constant of battle course. to not bend back to this um, structure of school. Um, we also thought about how can we make some changes within how we organize our building instead of having all the kindergartners in this row, in this classrooms, we have lap teachers out in the portables mm -hmm. where kids have to run back and forth. We thought, what if we made a family structure within our school? So we have a K-5 pods. So our, we have four pods and we think of those, those pods of classrooms like a little mini longhouse. And in that longhouse, you have aunties and uncles and um, relatives all in that space. That's the dream. So we have um, families now living in that space. So mm. if kids need um, need a break, if they need a hug, if, if a teacher needs that as well yeah, we that's have right people there ready to support um and that we're in the infancy stages of, of this and yes. anytime interruption happens change brings about this um this this um regulation or this change yeah. and you yeah. might feel um like it's not working but it's not about working it's about interrupting what always has been, we know for a fact that doesn't work. We know for a fact, if we maintain the status quo in our school system, it's not serving all of our students. And it's definitely not serving our indigenous people. That's right. I, you know, you said, Chelsea there, you said, that's the dream and it's not perfect. Earlier, Anthony, you said, um, we have, we don't have it all figured out, but we know, um, that what, what we know that there is a way we've been told that and shown that and we know that this current way isn't the way because we've been shown that very clearly mm -hmm. um and so i'm thinking a lot about that you know um ruth wilson gilmore talks about abolition being a presence and um and that you all are enacting a presence um as you work to sort of dismantle the thing as it is you're in you're you're enacting the thing as you hope or dream it will be and that that we don't have to know all the answers to do that work. We, but we, we have to, in a sense, I'm looking at your, um, your shirt, Chelsea, upset their colonization. And once you upset it, then you're like, okay, so where are we now? And mm -hmm. what are the, um, who are we um, receiving guidance from? And what can we do right in front of us to make, um, to make some sort of a change that we know is right? And, and so, you know, that is really, I think, important for us all to think about in our ongoing process of becoming, right, the, the educators and community members that we, that we want to be, that that's just a lifelong process. Um, anything that you want to say related to any of this before we kind of move to a, a, a very related um, another topic? I, I do. I, you know, I always do. Chelsea gets uh, my wheels turning. So I won't, <laughs> I won't quote it. I won't quote her exactly, but there's this idea that uh, Linda Tahui Y. Smith, who I That's love right. to call Auntie Linda, no one's giving me that permission, but I'll just say Auntie <laughs> Linda has taught us in her decolonizing methodologies, which is to to make a very clear claim: there are no neutral spaces. It's either a settler space or we've reclaimed it. So when we say it's in process, it's not all the way figured out. That's just our reclamation of that space and time and organization of the school like Chelsea's naming, because we're not just saying no, no, no to all these settler things. We're actually saying yes to all of our, our teachings. It's Chelsea and Anthony aren't magical. We believe in the strength of the culture. We believe in the power of the teachings. And we believe it's on us to keep turning back to the teachings, especially when we don't know exactly what they are. Boarding schools mm. were not successful in eradicating our life ways. They were successful in that um, severing, Django, that you talked about. But yeah. It wasn't a complete severing. Of course they're not. They, they, yeah. And they're still in us. So that turning back is that is the daily decision that we make. And um, to say, if I leave the school organized the way it is, if I do classroom management the way we've always done it, you know, maybe it'll work. No, that's not neutral. That's a, that's a settler assimilative approach 
to reclaim it as something different means I'm saying yes to something different. So we're not just out here, you know, slapping down all these ideas that are settler ideas. We're actually nurturing our, our cultural ideas the best we can. The, we right. know enough to get started is what grandpa said. So his call wasn't, you know, enough to make it perfect. His call was <laughs> you know <laughs> enough to get started. Then, you know, the, the intergenerational when, you know, we had this grandma at one point that's really stands out in my mind who said, yeah, my grandson and granddaughter who I raised, they love morning assembly. They come home singing the songs. I don't know those songs. So she came to morning assembly, stayed late and asked me, can I be here? Yes, absolutely beautiful. this is a space for you. She saw it as a deficit. I see it as a strength that in her cultural way, she knows how to go get what she needs to be closer related. So becoming relatives is, is those enactments too of how can I get even closer to this? So the strength in that grandma, buying a shawl for her granddaughter, buying a drum for her grandson, coming to learn the songs, those are strengths in our culture. That's not deficits. So just that idea of reclaiming that one thing made all these other things possible. And I, I can't not say there's this uh, teacher in Yakima, a Yakima teacher who teaches first grade. Her and Chelsea remind me so much of each other. But she says, my kids are my kids forever. Like the, the system wants me to have them for 180 days. Right. Get their attendance record and their test scores, pass them to the next person. But what Chelsea's describing is these are always our kids. Like those 30 year olds, they're still, I still looked at them as when they walked in my kindergarten classroom. Yeah. Hey, hey, good to see you. <laughs> Catch me up on their life. Their kids are at Chelsea's school now. So the, the, the enactments where you reclaim one thing, that's where the culture then takes over and reminds us we have all these ways of being related. We're not, we're not making it up. And um, th that, you know, the imperfections are not a negativity. The imperfections are allowing for that turning back to, to be generative. So um, I know we're running um, a little bit longer on time at this point, but I, I and we've been talking about this in some way. Um, you were just in, in many ways talking about it, but, but if we could just spend a, a moment thinking more specifically um, about leadership. Um, and so I'm thinking about the powerful work centering these knowledges, the knowledges of these territories that, that you're working to do, Anthony, and also centering Black and other people of the global majority um, through the work that you're trying to do and that you're doing in the Leadership for Learning program. And so I just wanted to think a little bit about how are you two thinking about leadership in this work of becoming relatives? I know Chelsea, you said recently, the ancestors are at the center of my leadership. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if you just each wanna share a little bit or anything um, related to that. I've been so struck by the work that, that you've been doing for many years in L4L, Anthony, um, related to what you're just talking about. Um, uh, and it's interesting too, I think, for many of us to think about, you know, teaching kindergartners um, and then, you know, teaching and learning with kindergartners, being a community in that way, and then doing the same thing with 30 year olds or 40 year olds or 50 year olds. And so anything that just that you might want to say to folks about what leadership looks like or means in this context. I mean, Chelsea, you've shown me over the last couple of years, this is what leadership looks like when you're not you're not you're not going to wait um, and you're going to forge forward for your people um, in a sense, regardless, because, you know, you know, it's right. I think at the center, when I when we talk about ancestors being at the center of our leadership, leadership has to be seven generations, seven generations forward and back all at the same moment in time. That's the type of leadership I'm talking about with a sense of urgency that my ancestors had when they were um making sure that we we still existed in this place because mm -hmm. when they signed the treaty when they were forced to sign that was not a good that was not an easy decision but they knew that we would be standing here today and that we needed something that would secure who we were they set the path for us i'm just picking it up and carrying what they set forward um what my what my own ancestors 
I'm carrying their work forward. And I'm thinking about as a leader, what can I do to set the ground for the next generation? Oh, wow. So it's multi-generational leadership that needs to happen. But it, it, it critical it is to interrupt the colonial state of leadership in school systems that is a hierarchy. That right. is not something that a model that works in our community. That um, That is a harmful model that um, establishes a small table who a small group has a voice, but in actuality, we need to extend our hands. And I often say this in our morning assembly as we're sitting, seated around the whole outside. And I raise my arms out because it's like we're standing hand in hand, all of us circling our kids. When we do that, it ensures that we don't leave anyone behind. It ensures mm. that um, all of the knowledge is the gifts under the roof. Like my mother says in the longhouse, each of us would have a gift. We all carry different gifts. So if it's a triangle, there's many people that are unheard and unseen. But if we stand hand in hand, then all those gifts can be brought forward for the betterment of our people. Um, thank you for, for also bringing the, the, that beautiful teaching from, from your mother, um, Patty Gobin to to this um, conversation about the gifts under the roof and um, and recognizing and working to um, create conditions to grow the gifts of each person. Um, Anthony, anything you'd like to say? Nothing that can top what Chelsea just said. I'll, I'll say that <laughs> you know, I tried to give it some labels that are you know not my own. These are not novel ideas, but you know, collective leadership, like Chelsea's saying, is much more impactful and sustainable because it, it lives in humans than hierarchies. Hierarchies live right. on an organizational chart that's flat on a paper, uh, positional authority, job descriptions. Collective leadership lives in the humans who are enacting ideas, asking questions, learning together. So one, one of the ways I think about leadership and teach about leadership and learn about leadership is to imagine what are the relationships we're building. So we're not just solving technical, rational problems in technical, rational ways. We are creating futures. So if we have a relationship where we can imagine together, we can refuse together, we can enact new ideas together, that's much bigger than solving sort of a list of problems that come at us as administrators or as teachers. I'm really struck by your severing idea, Django, because we sever teachers from each other. This is your classroom and your class right. principal. This is your school, your office. You make these decisions because the superintendent and her cabinet are making these decisions. Well, what if we hold the futures we're imagining together so we can decide what can we do today, this week, this school year, this trimester, whatever it is, we hold mm -hmm. time in a different way because we're holding it together. We don't have our just our individual task, you know, to-do lists, because this is on my job description. We have a collective sense for what we're trying to accomplish. We hold tensions together. You know, we, we face um, backlash together. It's just much more sustainable to, to be good. in a collective. So that's what I would add to what Chelsea's saying and what she's doing. Chelsea and I have been reflecting on, you know, it was 1997, 98. Chelsea was just a recess teacher at the same school where she's now an administrator. And anybody who says, oh, uh, now Chelsea's a leader. I, 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 I kind of reject that. Chelsea was a Absolutely. leader was outside for you know her two hour classified position at recess with young people. She was a leader then and our parapros are leaders now. Every position in that school participates in the leadership because they're participating in the future shaping and we talked about Kamayakin, but I want to say to the world, it's not just Kamayakin. There are other young Tulalip people and older Tulalip people teaching the culture, teaching through the culture. That's a collective. So when you start to, you know, light these little flames, other people bring their flame there. Now you have this fire that's clearing the land for all of our ideas to reemerge. You know, the teaching that got from Patty Gobin about yeah, our people used to control fires so camas bulbs would come back stronger in future generations. Like the, mm -hmm. we might be in a burning stage right now, but there are also fields that we've started that have been started, not just by us, that things are growing. Like there are so many powerful people in Tulalip that we're learning from and with. 
that we're trying to hold space for. It's not a Chelsea and Anthony show. It's actually the culture. There's lots of room for the culture if we hold it. You're reminding me, and we'll we'll, we'll sort of end, you know, um, I think, you know, here more or less, but you're reminding me of something that you two have been talking about, about the idea of return. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about return lately, about the return to life ways that have sustained people and lands for generations. Um, about the return of people to lands and places. I'm thinking about, you know, the right of return for Palestinians to their homelands. And you two recently shared, so this idea of return, um, you already know enough to get started. You have a way, what does it mean to return, but return now in the world as it is today. And so you recently shared that you're returning to the salmon as teachers or as guides in this work. Um, can you can you uh, say a little bit about what that means, um, either of you, or or talk about about that idea of returning to the salmon as teachers? I'll start because I don't want to follow Chelsea again. <laughs> I'll just say uh, <laughs> I'll just say that for me, as a Yakima person moving here, um, I've had people I grew up with say, "Oh, you didn't seem like a very cultural person when we were young. Like now, you're talking mm -hmm. about stories and language." Well, A, we're always changing. I'm that's always right. learning. And B, I think that's a cultural way of being is to is to learn and, and to be curious and to want to know more. So I learned through mostly through ceremony in Tulalip about the return of salmon and um, when, when the first king salmon comes back to these territories, what's our responsibility? So there's relationship there. There's relationship between the human world and the salmon world. Uh, which then leads to uh, killer whales that I think are very, very um, strong teachers to these territories. The Tulalips are killer whale people. That could be a whole other episode about what killer whales mean to these territories and peoples. That's but right. I'll say it's resilience, it's relationship, it's uh, drive toward a particular kind of future. And I've been learning kind of uh, more recently about overcoming settler obstacles. Like, what are we talking about when we're talking about removing dams or what dams have done to our rivers? What are we doing when we're talking about the Bolt decision, which, you know, just reached a milestone age when people, the, the people were separated from their relationship with uh, salmon and other shellfish. Anyway, so just to say mm -hmm. the salmon world and our world is very connected. And I think the resiliency and relationality are, are you know, underscored for me and in, in what I'm paying attention to now. Mm, thinking of Bernie Gobin, of course, and what you all have shared with me about him as a leader, as a carver, as a fisherman, as, a, as someone who's worked on treaty rights, um, too, as you share that. Chelsea, things coming up for you around the return to the salmon as guides? Yeah, I was actually um, thinking about this when we we're talking about leadership, um, because the earth teaches us about leadership. Um, the cedar tree, which gives life to our people, mm. our mother, our, our grandmother, cedar tree provided so much for us, is the backbone of our school. It's a model to learn from. We had an ancient fishing weir that our people would um, gather fish and hold them in places so we we could go provide subsistence for subsistence for our people. Mm -hmm. That ancient weir is our leadership model. It's a way of guiding people in a direction that's good for them and ensuring that people who aren't quite ready to move on, we're taking care of them before. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's leadership and learning that can happen through the waters. Um, and um, water has a lot to teach us. If you have ears to hear is what I was always <laughs> When we're learning, we're not learning just with our mind, but all parts of ourself at a spiritual level. What messages for you from these territories? Um, so that respect for the land and what it has to teach us is just um, connected to the salmon. Thank you so much, um, both of you. And um I think a little later today, um, jaw willing, I will um, have an opportunity to go down to the water and um, and just sit with um, with the teachings and the the knowledges that you're offering there. 
um, Chelsea and Anthony. Um, for people who don't know, these Coast Salish lands are just absolutely gorgeous. Um, just so beautiful. And so um, thank you both for your time today, for all you do in the world. I wanna thank everyone who um, was listening to this episode. We're really hopeful that you can take this um, into your own communities, into the teaching and learning you do um, across as you um, offered um, Chelsea seven generations, the past, present and the future. Um, I also wanna thank um, our research assistant, Siata Padmore. I wanna thank Caleb Albright for his production work. Uh, making this shareable to you all. So as many have said before, another world is possible and another educational world is possible. Peace and blessings, everyone.